So we've got all sorts of bits and pieces going on. When I get home, like work doesn't stop. I've got lots more stuff to do. But a few years ago, um, we decided to put together a bit of a Facebook page so passengers, if they wanted to, if you want to come and have a look at some of what we do, um, you can do. So we put together a Facebook page and we put up photos and videos of some of the things that we, we rescue and look after and even just, just some of the, the wildlife and cameras that we have when we do go for a bit of a walk. And Alma down on Wednesday night, I went for a walk and I found a, a knobtail gecko and a bird and legless lizards are really cool critters so I did a bit of a video on them and snuck it up there yesterday. So if you want to come and have a look at that page at all on Facebook, if you're on there, you're more than welcome to. It's called Will and Mel's Wild Life. Clever name, eh? Will and Mel's Wild Life. Wild Life. Wild Life. Two names. Absolutely sensational. I came up with that. So if you want to come and check out Will and Mel's Wild Life, you are more than welcome. But be warned. It's not always about wildlife. Every now and then, like you, some of you saw me singing last night, every now and then Will does something a little bit wild, and maybe that ends up on there too. I just had a passenger come up to me at afternoon tea and she said, oh, I've got a, I've got a bit of blackmail material. And I was sad. She said, oh, I've got a video of you singing a song last night. I could, I could put it up on Facebook. Oh, you can't threaten me with stuff like that because I put much worse stuff on Facebook. Do you guys remember our first lockdown in 2020? You remember when everyone went into lockdown the very first time? You remember how we were all just sitting around for like three months with nothing to do? We have watched Tiger King. We have played every bloody board game in the house. We've drunk ourselves uh, like we'd never have before. We're all very bored, we're all hanging around just not knowing what to do. What does the future hold for us? The train hadn't operated. We hadn't been out to see any of our friends in the communities. Their lives hadn't changed a great deal. And they were sending us messages saying, hey, what's it like on the coast? What's going on down there? So we're communicating a lot. I said, geez, we miss you. We can't wait for you to get back up here. One of the girls at Mount Surprise, she messaged me, she's like, hey Will, she's like, I saw that there's this, this day coming up. And she said, and when I saw the advert for it, I couldn't help but think of you and Mel, and I thought, you know what, they'd probably do that. She's like, here, check out the link, so I have a look at the link. World Naked Gardening Day. That's a real day. It's the first Saturday in May, and the idea is to get you out in the garden, in touch with nature, in the mood, get a bit of sun on your bum trees, plant a tree. World Naked Gardening Day. So we're bored as anything, Mel and I are just sitting at home. And when we got that message, we thought, you know what, that'd be funny. We should do World Naked Gardening Day. We'll get around the garden, we'll take a bunch of photos, starkers. And then we'll send it to everyone back out in the communities. We'll give them a bit of a laugh, like, that'll be funny. So along comes the day, Mel and I were down in the garden having a few drinks, walking around and dressing down. And we're coming up with ideas, different scenarios in the garden. We set up the camera, put it on the tripod, you know, put the, the, the timer on, then we go and get in position. The photo will go off. We can't have to study the photo really closely. We were very tasteful about it. You never see anything you shouldn't see. There was always a very strategically placed pot plant or a bloody big cucumber, you know. So we go and we have a look at the photo. Yep, no, it looks good. Can't see anything. That's brilliant. And once we got all these photos done, we sat down and we tried to come up with witty captions. Funny witty captions. Um, we had all sorts of things. You know, there's there's a picture there. Mel's got a handful of earthworms. And, and my bum is just above it. And underneath she says, yay, we got worms. You know, funny, quippy things. So after we've done it all, we... Um, we put them up on Facebook and we press enter just for our mates to see. Where I went wrong is I forgot to check the privacy setting. <laughs> the 
next morning I woke up and I thought Facebook had blown up on me. I had thousands upon thousands of messages. I couldn't understand why. One of the first messages was from that girl who sent me the original article. And now surprised, she said, oh my God, have you seen your post? I'm like, no. I click on it to go and have a look. 273 million views. What the hell? The rest of the world was doing the same thing we were, but there was other parts of the world where COVID was affecting a lot worse. Places like Italy, you know? So all these people all over the planet are all sitting down in lockdown, sitting on social media, scrolling through, looking at one post about COVID after another post about COVID. There was so much death, so much sadness, so much uncertainty. And then here's a post of an Aussie couple moving in the garden. <laughs> That's funny. And we got so many messages from people saying, thank you so much. This was hilarious. This brought a smile to our face. Thank you. So a lot of these messages were in other languages. We had to translate. We were on radio shows. We were on TV. Do you know that TV show, Big Brother? Big Brother wanted me and Mel to go on there as contestants, thinking that we'd just walk around the house nude gardening all the time. Like, we just did it once. But it went all over Facebook. If you type in nude gardening into Google, into Facebook, into Instagram, whatever it is, you will see me and Mel naked in our garden. So it's very hard to threaten me with, oh, I've got a video of you being a bit naughty when I'm naked all over the internet. The weird thing about it was, uh, do you remember I told you earlier that I went and got the Savannah Lander emblem tattooed on my shoulder? I didn't know, well no I did know, but I hadn't had any feedback from the boss when this was happening, when it was everywhere. These photos all over the place. And there's the Savannah Landers logo front and centre and all. Just long enough. 
Hamish to put the staff back in the box and then we'll keep on going. Chilba is another barbering word, means a big dead tree. We don't know exactly what tree. Yeah. 
shortly, but there's been some contractual differences over the last few years. I don't know what it is. And some of it now is going down to uh, Mossman. That's a process long, there. That's a long way. It is, yeah. I think it's coming from Mossman to here because they're down one pillar. Oh, right. It's going the other way.
old Chico station site here, we really see that we're back away and well out of the Savannah country. We see a lot more European breeds of cattle now. On the right coming up there's the three really cool Texas Longhorn cows. And then on the left just after the road crossing we see a whole bunch of different uh, European cattle again. Oh, 
possibly some sourous crowns as well amongst you. So the Brolga is on the uh, Queensland coat of arms. So the Brolga and uh, a red deer. The Brolga, of course, is native, the red deer is not. Whole host, whole host of Brolga. Sarah's cranes. The Brogas have black legs, yeah. yeah. They have red legs. section 
and uh, we got uh, issuing officer Ian Bailey at 1528, rail traffic through HMH. Hey, sounds good there, Hamish. Uh, thanks for mate. Yeah, just over a bridge apparently. Just uh, need to take the city of For the silence there, folks, just have to uh, talk to train control and do a few things. We've got a little bit more track now, they're uh, letting us get at least as far as just outside of Coranda. And uh, it's given us a uh, temporary speed restriction for a bridge between uh, Maibura and Kulla as we go along. But on the left, there's a little granite mountain over there that's known as uh, Turkey Hill. The story is uh, that during World War II there was a fair bit of military uh, military training activity all around this way. Allied forces apparently used to use that hill for uh, artillery rounds and uh, bombing practice and stuff. And the locals thought it was a bit of a Turkish. history available in this region. I have not myself uh, gone deep on it at all, but uh, I do know that the Athol Tablelands area was a pretty significant player uh, during World War II. There's still a fair bit of evidence, uh, artefacts in the region. To that effect. As we make our way down the Chuko Bank, Towards Atherley Creek, you get some pretty nice views, vistas out on the right hand side there. Atherton Tableland is still a very fertile agricultural area, lots of uh, red soil, and lots of uh, legumes grown there, so lots of peanuts and potatoes, as well as a whole bunch of other things, coffee. Apparently, the Atherton Tablelands is reportedly where 80% of the coffee that's grown in Australia is grown. There's quite a few coffee farms out there to the right, up towards Atherton and Tolga. If you've been in Cairns for some time and you've got access to a car, it's worth spending a day driving around all through those areas there, taking lots of loose change with it. There's a whole host of little farm gate uh, honesty box stores. Beautiful produce, so not a lot of money here, but the Hublot full of great stuff and really good prices.
trains uh, used to come in from out there, from where we've been, from other branches, Mount Mulligan, Mount Malloy, Miller Miller, and so on, and they'd be remarshaled here in the uh, former station yards here at Mariba. <laughs> Roads, a loco depot, servicing pits, facilities, a coal stage. It was a, it was a monster of a place for a railway. Uh, but that sort of really fell away in the late 80s into the early 90s. up ahead of us there's a bit of an orange awning that's all that's left of it. Apparently the wooden station building used to be behind it. Um, it was badly riddled with terminals. Turning triangle track on the left. Old platform on the right. And we uh, that, that's it for the Mariba Rail precinct. It's really just a bit of a skeleton. That's what it used to be once. desensitise to rail traffic because we're the only thing that comes out here. A lot of them don't understand what to do at level crossings. side of that and we're going to cross the Burke Development Road for the fifth and final time today. Across the, that'll be a fifth crossing. Processing plant. And 
over that the cook valves and the stench of the, the chicken byproducts went across the golf course. They'd be destined for here, they'd be unloaded on the left into the Marina sail yards. Sail yards are still active, but the uh, railway function on it is long gone. And just here on the left, coming up, some old silos. These were apparently used in the days when rice was grown up here. These days are used for uh, stock feed. They're home to lots of kangaroo, uh, cockatoos, and guinea fowl here.
at uh, Bodhura, just a little road here, just a couple of houses. But just ahead of us, we're going to cross over the Barren River, and it's the only time on the trip that we're going to cross the Barren. A little bit later on, though, we do follow the Barren side by side for about 22 kilometres. The old Mount Malloy line used to swing off just here on the left through that clearing there.
keep in mind it's one of these bridges we've got a temporary speed restriction on that we were given before, so it must be the next one. Just keep in mind it's one of these bridges we've got a temporary speed restriction. It's from here too, you'll see that the scenery and the landscapes around us start changing. We've left behind agricultural land now, and we're moving into a blend of Melaleuca and eucalypt forests until we get around the back of Coranda into uh, wet tropical rainforest. Around here, very, very rich in Melaleuca, some northern cypress there as well. Chains across the um, few sleepers there yeah. holding on. You are driving too close to the Too easy. You could have done that in your sleep. I know, right? <laughs> So from here on we're going to continue through this Melaleuca forest. We're going to go through an area known as Monk's Gap. So the railway line passes up through a little gap between a couple of small mountain ranges. Apparently it was named after G.W. or George W. Monk. He was the surveyor who planned to put the railway there. When you build a railway you want to avoid having to do too much earthworks or as little as possible. So he did he achieved that by uh, planning the path of the railway to fit between the two little hills.
General Motor? Nah. nah. They've all had a couple of motors through them since. I think he shit himself then. Eh? Good. <laughs> Some bush rocks. Yeah. He shouldn't be on that track, should he? Technically, no.
then a couple steps as you get older, you don't want many steps. Yeah, yeah. But yeah.
the past trains here. Just ahead of us, we're going to cross over the Closey River. Closey River, just ahead of us, on the left-hand side, you can see where it flows into the Barren River. It was named after uh, sub-inspector Thomas Closey. He was a young Irishman who immigrated to Australia on his own at about 23 years of age in the 1860s. He was a member of the Irish Constabulary. He came out here to join up the very, very fledgling Queensland Mountain Constabulary. And he went on to have a pretty distinguished career in the Queensland Police Force. Rose fairly quickly through the ranks and he was known for his humanity, diplomacy and efficiency in discharging his duties. He rose to the rank of uh, the Brockhampton Area Police Commander. Uh, he died not long after taking the office. He only died, he died fairly young, about 44 years of age. And that's, uh, that river was named in honour of him. He served up in a lot of these places in the very early days. Now from here through to Coranda, the vistas outside the window are going to keep transitioning. At the moment, we're in this little patch of Melalucas and there's some beautiful little grass trees growing, the Xantharias. They're quite prolific through this little patch. And then progressively, it's going to get cooler and darker as we enter towards the rainforest canopy. Yeah. You do it all yourself, do you? No, I haven't started. 
bother too much yet, but I No, but you will do, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 90% of the battle. I've got a mate of mine who owns a bus business in Brisbane. He's got a full workshop. Oh. He's, he's on board with it. He said, oh, we can do the whole thing here in my workshop. Be nice to him, mate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, as we continue to move closer towards Corinda, we do start getting lovely views of the Darren River over on our left-hand side. We do have to sort of turn around and look over our shoulder a little bit, but I'll tell you what, at this time of day with that dappled sunlight on it, there's some really quite spectacular views. It's quite uh, worth it in the effort you want to make.
is the most arduous piece of the track. It's the one that was significantly difficult to construct. A lot of lives were lost. That caused uh, quite a lot of uh, trauma for the uh, construction contract at John Rock. We'll talk all about that when we get uh, down the other side of Aaron Falls. At the moment, just on the last bits of stage three of the Kings Railway, constructed between about 1893 and 1894. sections now as we get closer to green and again there's been a bit of desensitization because there's not trains on there except when we come through. So a lot of locals around this area tend to use the track as a personal walking path. And uh, we also need to be mindful of uh, fallen trees and stuff. So the last rail vehicle through here was us on Wednesday morning. Now, Willie and I have had some pretty spectacular runs where we've done really well with time and we're barreling along and we're just happy as a clam. You'll come around the corner and then there's a bloody great big tree lying across the track in front of you. We had that happen uh, oh, about four weeks ago. And uh, we come around the corner and there's a great big green hard timber tree of some sort of about five great big trunks or five big thick branches and we had to stop because if we had to clob at that at speed that would have done some serious damage. Uh, and then uh, it took us 50 minutes by using one of us on a tomahawk and the other one on a handsaw to clear it. So needless to say we're a bit late.
these days is a house up there on the right, but this was the end of the Cairns Railway for about 12 months. This is we're coming off the end of stage three of the Cairns Railway and transitioning onto what was stage two. Now at its peak, Myola had quite a substantial township here when it was the railhead, it was the end of the line, so there was locomotive turning facilities here just in this area around us immediately. And Cobham Cove Stagecoaches actually moved their booking office from Port Douglas through to Myola uh, in that period. And now we are on stage two. Oh, 
sections of track. Like I said, local, uh, locals get very familiar with the train schedules, but they forget about us. So I'll come back to you shortly. We'll just uh, coast through the platform here nice and steady, and I'll talk to train control, get our next authority, and we'll get out of here. C99 with release code 0. C99 North Lego. Release code is 566 339 408 over. Track 5C99, clear, Bill, be 
That's great, no brother. So my thanks very much. I see 99 with Starbucks, though. There's a signal box just here on the right going past my window. That's where all the signals work from. Oh, is that my startup codes are 487 470 343 and 844 Thank you, Commander. Out of there is four six eight seven four six six seven four. 